la vérité touche au réel. Young Zizekians have assembled. We have a very special guest. We have a special guest with us. Brian Becker, Dr. Tom McGowan himself, the inimitable Russell Spriglia, Isabel Millar, engaging in conscious. In the imaginary domain, we have an intersubjective dialectic. Vanishing mediators. What is up, everybody? It is the Vanishing Mediators. I am your host, Young Jock, joined today by the big Signorelli. What's the big up? Sig, the big Sig, big Botticelli, Botafili. What is good, everybody? Just we are right here in our second installment for uh, Seminar 3, uh, Psychosis. The first one went really well. Um, and so we're definitely excited to get into the second chapter of it. And uh, third, um, what we'll be uh, discussing today, Nick, what exactly is today the event? We're going to be talking about repression, delusion, and a little bit about structural linguistics. Once we get to chapter three, the conversation surrounding psychosis becomes a little bit easier to grasp because the conversation is situated more so in the realm of structural linguistics. Whereas with one and two, as we were discussing before we started recording, we are very much in the orbit of the psychiatric notions surrounding psychosis at the time that Lacan is lecturing. So I think certain aspects of uh, his explorations here are a bit obscure to us, but it will become clearer. Yeah. And so I think to start it off with, we should inquire about the, in, not an interlocutor, but someone who he is very much uh, critical of and is evoked through this uh, second chapter. Uh, Emile Kraplin, I believe is how you pronounce it right, or Kraplin, uh, a very influential German psychi uh, psychiatrist during the um, you know 20th century, early 19th and or late 19th, early 20th century. Um, I think he was also um, you know well associated with uh, Wilhelm Wundt, which is the founder of uh, scientific psychology or uh, experimental psychology, and he was also very critical of psychoanalysis and uh, lived around the same time as Freud and did not. Uh, agree with Freud's discoveries because for him, what makes Kreplin sort of influential um, thinker and uh, psychiatric, um, you know, scientist or psychiatrist is that his emphasis is to look at these illnesses and base them on natural scientific facts, concepts that could be located on a naturalistic framework, right? And so one of his things is to re-look at the, um, you know, the, the term used for schizophrenia or psychosis at the time was dementia praecox, which is uh, referenced a lot in these early seminars, especially seminar one, when we talked about the difference between Freud and Jung and uh, where they theoretically diverge from on the notion of libido, especially when it comes to Freud's discovery of narcissism and Jung's emphasis on Dementia Precox and schizophrenia. And so the reason why uh, this shows that libido is not sexual, but that's a tangent. The point is, is that for Kreplin, he wants to split up this uh, term into, well, he, he calls the term endogenous psychosis, and he breaks it down to two categories. You have schizophrenia on one end, which he believes uh, originates from a sort of organic biological cause and over time its evolution causes deterioration in uh, the cognitive functions and even uh, the brain itself and then 
uh, the manic depression, which he believes are just uh, episodic and uh, mainly due to a sort of affective dimension, uh, passions and emotional instability that could trigger this. But ultimately, I think what Kreplin is doing is he wants to keep these natural scientific causes as something that could be located into uh, an internal uh, internal cause, an internal process, rather than something that is triggered from exterior var variables. Um, and uh, Lacan is just very dubious of this. And he even says that the notion of delusion, delusion is very paradoxical. And why? because at one point it is something that is caught or, or it, it happens in psychosis. Um, it's not a symptom, but it's sort of what gets triggered in psychosis, if not paranoia. But why he sees it as paradoxical is because at one point, this is something that manifests on the psychotic. But these thinkers, not just... Uh, uh, Kraplin, but also someone like Claren Boltz, who's another uh, uh, psychiatrist, and then a couple other people that he references, try to locate the delusion and the hallucinations, the verbal hallucinations and all this stuff to a level of understanding in which there could be a deeper meaning of the delusion itself. But what Lacan says is that, no, you're always trying to locate it down to an imaginary meaning of understanding in which you pretty much think that there is this sort of key behind the veil of the sort of illusion or whatever. Uh, and he's like, because of this, you're always going to go into all these different uh, frameworks of, oh, is it a biological, natural thing? Or does it happen from some time, uh, a type of internal psychic cause? And if so, what can we uh, derive a meaning from? When he's like, no. And so he evokes his three registers again. And he shows that, well, if we look at the psychotic, as we discussed in the last uh, episode, that a psychotic forecloses the symbolic order. They foreclose language or the master signifier that allows for language and symbolic uh, meaning or the symbolic chain to create the unconscious. All they have is this. Um, complete ego identification with themselves. And so this imaginary relation is structured by paranoid delusion. So there's not anything behind the delusion itself because it is the ego that is structurated by such manifestations itself. And because it doesn't have the symbolic order, it doesn't have language, metaphor, and even the symbolic big other as the effect of speech or language. And so it relies on the imaginary little other, which creates a sort of uh, you know, frustration or anticipation because as we think about these registers, there is a sort of temporal imaginary anticipation that happens in the imaginary. And so it's always fleeting, it's never consistent. And so in relation to an other imaginary other, um, this can trigger um, a, a, a paranoid delusion in what we could think of as an imaginary real. And so far as this real is what brings about um, these hallucinations in the psychotic. And there's something Lacan says here about the delusion and how contrary to what Kraplin has to say about it, the delusion is not like a stable system that develops over time, which is stemming from right. an erroneous understanding of reality. And it's, and Lacan also says it's not, to be thought of as like a cyst. Yeah. Or maybe the metaphor that might also work is that of like a tumor that should be 
removed yeah it is itself structuring yeah inclusion structures the entire system of the paranoiac um misrecognition of yeah other right because like a kind of he uses this other metaphor of how with the leaf and the plant you can see how the veining in a leaf in some way replicates the development of the entire tree yeah ways. and i think that's like how paranoia in this case a paranoid delusion as emblematic of how psychosis works should be understood as having that same kind of structuring force for yeah. a subject who has not been admitted into the symbolic order right and and it's like this whole thing about understanding an imaginary meaning of this delusion is like oh there's always some something inherent within it that the subject is trying to say it's almost like well here we're dealing with with a psychotic structure but when we look at like seminar two when we have someone like maurice merleau ponty that tries to say psychoanalysis uh and, and phenomenology are on the same project of, of of a humanism because of understanding and getting at understanding uh the human and in, in the world where it's like well what what are you talking about as far as understanding because you're getting into this level of intersubjectivity you know there is a sort of third that comes about and right here this third is foreclosed um and maybe i could like as i end this sentence we could get into the importance of understanding repression contra to um uh foreclosure um and it's like well you can't do that same frame into a psychotic because it's as you said there's no like thing behind the veil there's, it's not like you have this appearance of a delusion and the real thing being sought after behind it. It's like, no, it's actually a semblance itself. <laughs> like this, if that makes sense, right? Yeah. And it's, it's maybe like semblance is the thing, but it's like, it's all on the surface. It's, exactly. and it's because, yeah. so, and the last thing I'll say is, well, like these these psychiatrists are locating everything in a sort of organicist or psychogenetic cause, which are all internal factors. But if we look at what the ego is, it's an alienation, right? And so that means that we are always outside of ourselves before we are inside of ourselves. And we, our ego relies on an other, an imaginary other. For the neurotic, we also have the symbolic other that comes from the other half of alienation through language. But if you don't have language, you're just completely alienated on an imaginary temporal anticipation of, of mirroring. But there's still gaps because it's not a full total gestalt. Um, it, it is a misrecognition. And with that imaginary state, you don't have the symbolic to kind of pressurize it and to not only make it temporal, but also to make things last. Because what is the signifier or the name of the thing allow the thing to do to also die, but also to maintain its presence? in its absence, the whole thing about the elephant, right? You know, we don't have to have the elephant in the room to talk about the elephant's rights, its geographical location, et cetera, um, do many things with the signifier, but there is no signifier right here for the psychotic. Uh, it's just a sort of imaginary paranoid uh, structure uh, that gets triggered in the sort of imaginary framework that it's encapsulated in. And a lot of it can't be uh, taken account for. And so, the real and excess of that imaginary aspect comes back in the form of a hallucination or delusion. And so this brings up repression, right? What, what is the difference between repression and, and, and foreclosure? Well, we talked about negation, Verneinung versus Ververfung and, and foreclosure. So repression is the mechanism that happens in a neurotic and it's the driving force for the unconscious it, it, it is repression the unconscious is mechanized and moved by repression which the we have to dissect the, the common notion of like oh it's this suppressed thing or it's like oh it's some hidden 
thing within me and this cauldron of instincts is like, no, repression can only happen due to language, due to the symbolic order and so far as you're admitted into that. So we could think of repression not as something that's hidden, but rather uh, a mechanism of substitutions based upon um, a prohibition. So we we have uh, this, the psychic apparatus or the unconscious operates on this, this signifying substitution of negativity based upon the know of the father, which is the signifier, the, the S1. Um, and so the know of the father is, is a prohibition on enjoyment, or as I said in the last episode, uh, the, the no of the father's prohibition means that you can no longer live with that without prohibition. And so it always is instantiated off of a sort of traumatic insistence in which marks the time and the cause of the subject. So not a lot can be accounted for that. And so repression takes forth in creating signifying chain in which we have different substitutions Right. Creates metaphors and, and, and antinomy, which we'll get into in this seminar. But we should think of repression as like the subject trying to account for itself, like in the last seminar, in the signifying chain, but there's always gaps. And so it's like the subject retroactively comes back to try to account for and mark those gaps. And it's within those gaps that we see repression happen because it doesn't make up the whole totality of the subject. There's always something missing in a person's life. And so what happens is we get these formations of the unconscious, um, slips of the tongue, right? Um, witticisms, uh, portmanteaus, which would be like neologisms, especially at the random play on words that have nothing to do outside of analysis, but they have significance in analysis in so far as they mark a certain point in which, okay, the unconscious is speaking, it's, it's the discourse of the big other and the subject's relation to the big other in which something wasn't accounted for. And so that leaves a, 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 a port importance for associating because that certain homophony or I mean that certain like portmanteau witticism slip of the tongue uh, creates a, a point for us to dig deeper because the point of repression is never perfect it always leaves a trace of, of memory behind. Yeah. But ultimately we're dealing with language or the unconscious structure like a language. So now we could get into ver verifung or foreclosure and how that is radically different from repression because repression is the driving mechanism of the unconscious. The um, psychotic does not have an unconscious because in this moment of the of uh, the admission of the symbolic order via the know of the father, we have the threat of castration. And so it's like as if uh, the subject, which will be a psychotic subject, uh, not the neurotic split subject, radically refuses admission to the symbolic order and stays in this purely imaginary domain and thus is not hooked onto language. And forecloses the possibility of an S1 or the unary trait, as we would call it in the neurotic. And so this is why they're hooked onto the, this imaginary framework, which is ultimately formulated around uh, a paranoid delusion um, you know, structure. But why this is paradoxical when we talk about not just foreclosure, but like the notion of delusion is because at once, it is something that the psychotic suffers from, but it is also normal because we all have egos. We all had this imaginary domain before we were admitted to the language. So it's like part of our existence is, or the structure of our existence, our ego is paranoiac in essence. It is only through language that, you know, we aren't really paranoiac or psychotic, but yeah. the psychotic doesn't have that. And I think that some of the examples Lacan draws from to illustrate the sort of gradual integration into the symbolic order using um, different uh, clinical episodes of uh, he's wherein he dealt with, you know, 
children who are able to in in a sense isolate that signifying dimension and na- naively but also sort of shrewdly point out how the signifying dimension of language itself is based on convention or propriety it's just that we learn to mask those aspects of it um but it's almost like i guess one thing that's interesting about analyzing children in this way is that you can actually trace the sort of transition from something like correct me if i'm wrong like but almost like psychosis into becoming a neurotic subject but that's kind of a tangent no, and no, you're right. No, you're right. Though. It's really interesting too, though, because it's like with the signifying chain, what we get is the implementation of the time element itself yeah. without the name of a thing also serving as its time. Then the signifier for the psychotic subject isn't able to operationalize the logic necessary for us to be not just symbolically integrated subjects in the sense that we understand rules and prohibition, but we actually experience ourselves as a continuous in a temporal linear way, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And it's like what the psychotic deals with is what Lacan in this chapter calls dialectical inertia because it's as if this dialectic which i guess we could sort of equate with metonymy this leaping from one signifier to another one meaning this displacement of of meaning yes like mutually displacing um, units of meaning that don't exist for the psychotic it's as if they are suffering the uh, impact of this dialectical inertia where the logic of the signifier doesn't operate for them as it does for the neurotic. That's it. That's, and that's correct. And you pointed out something that I was going to mention, but I, I was just talking too fast when explaining the whole thing about how the signifiers are like sort of substituting um, it, it itself, like in, in this uh, uh, mechanism of repression and the no of the father, but displacement is a major symptom of, of repression. Um, we have displacement in which it's like that's so, something is just put onto another signifier or another object. Um, and then we have condensation and this manifests in fantasy and dreams. And especially in the dreams, when we look at Freud's um, interpretation of dreams, a lot of uh, themes of displacement, of displacing a certain f- unfulfilled wish onto another type of wish or object, or in which certain things condense into one sort of um latent content or as we could say signifier that associate to a lot of things which ultimately uh have a sort of maybe metonymic or metaphorical meaning for this unfulfilled wish because for freud it's like what is repressed is the sort of unfulfilled wish um the wish for uh satisfaction and he's still along the lines of the pleasure principle he hasn't uh discovered the death drive in this time but we could still see this uh unfulfilled wish still being operated on and it's like well with the reality principle you can't meet the demands of that because it's so harsh this external world that a secondary process for fulfilling that pleasure principle comes about in the unfulfilled wish of the dream but this happens for a a neurotic and what's interesting about what you're saying about like there's this sort of like pre-psychotic thing before we actually become neurotics and especially in children we have to look at uh something that Lacan was grappling with in the early first seminar. Um, he doesn't talk about death drive necessarily, but he is, he kind of associates death instinct with primary masochism. And this is something that's talked about a bit in the beginning of um, uh, an, an essay that's uh, talked about in uh, the fourth chapter. It's called, um, give me one second, uh, The Loss of Reality and Neurosis and Psychosis, um, in which primary we could see primary masochism operate but what it's doing is the fact it's that it's not that it wants to destroy the subject but rather it wants to reject all the sort of variables and and energy and entropy that are bestowed onto 
by the reality principle and withdraw into this own internal stimuli without the necessitation of the reality principle. And so we could kind of see the same thing with the psychotic in which there is this primary, uh, primary masochism, not to destroy oneself, but rather to reject the um, sort of harsh uh, demands of the reality principle for the sort of containment of the sort of uh, psi um, structure that you know Freud would talk about, psi, phi, and omega. So like psi is that internal stimuli and it's like, that's what the what you could see happen. We just flip the language around. We just call it foreclosure. Le sai. Yeah. You want to move on to the next chapter? I would love to. Yes. All right. This is where it gets good. Yeah. Now that we've cut the crap, Lynn. We yeah. We want to on. cut the crap. <laughs> cut the crap, Lynn. We're going to go straight into Schraber. Schraber, the other and psychosis. This is where things are really kicked into gear. And we start with this thing about homosexuality and paranoia. And he says here that the subject's unconscious drive in the case of President Schraber has always been interpreted by many analysts, maybe psychiatric thinkers, and and specifically as Freud like a, as a homosexual tendency, specifically who Freud as well, and and this is where like Lacan kind of wants to differentiate from because I mean he doesn't want to see his like hope this like resistance of homosexuality as like the sort of you know influential cause of like these psychotic breakdowns, um, but yeah, nevertheless, like yeah, like we get this sort of uh, talk about the homosexual tendency as like an influence on these episodes and how like there was a sort of defense mechanism from that happening because like from what I understand um you know he had like a very strict father uh Schraber did and like he couldn't have kids like like he tried having kids with his wife but it didn't work and he felt like a failure as a man and so like I think the communist perception was like that was straight into like a sort of homoerotic homosexual feeling in the form of like narcissism in which like the longing for a man or to be a man was like displaced into like a longing for a man in a homosexual tendency right so he ties that in with what he was talking about in the previous chapter with delusion but also, he says something here about, I guess we could say, the theorized causality behind this defense against homosexuality as trading in on a kind of ambiguity that goes unnoticed where the fear of, I should contextualize, he, President Schraber, is put in a position given a role and does not feel up to the task necessarily which would be the task imposed on him by the paternal function yeah. but that he is both a victim of the struggle itself as lacan puts it to live up to the charge given to him and also premature success and that these two which he says are a kind of interplay between conflict and the absence of a conflict actually create the sort of semiotic structure wherein like subjectivity would appear right but because he's not able to undertake the charge of the paternal function that what we get are i not coping me mechanisms but the they are sort of methods of coping with yeah uh, this I, sort I, of I, I like, like paternal function and and, and, and what we, we get we... a glimpse into the unconscious the mechanism of the system of the unconscious 
And wouldn't you say it's like this sort of dialectical inertia that was evoked in the second chapter that that's happening like that in these like breakdowns and stuff as a way to, well, I wouldn't say cope, but it's like reconcile with yeah, the maybe. ability to um, live up to the paternal metaphor. Right. And it's like, I haven't read Schraber, his memoir, but I know that like the patient Lacan describes here, whose entire, you know, um, symbolic universe is somehow concentrated into this like neologism of Galopiner. Yeah. That, and not symbolic universe, because again, if this is a delusional psychotic subject, then they are not a subject admitted into the symbolic world but i think maybe coping isn't the right word but the reconciliation that they're able to achieve you can correct me if i'm wrong is by merit of a specific signifier that does in a sense hold things together yeah i know that for uh it's like a substitute wouldn't nerve, you say nerve then yeah like nerve then uh, nerve non hung is for schraber <laughs> Uh, nerve contact one of these signifiers for this other subject we have gall open air but these are the actual like uh, um uh, let's say navel the navel of the psychosis in a sense yeah because the thing is like we have to and, and it's like it's almost like it's a signifier but it's not in the sense of a neurotic right and like these are neologisms but it's like they don't refer to any other signifier but itself like, trimethylamine like, yeah trimethylamine. it's 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 almost like trimethylamine but except it doesn't refer to the paternal it doesn't go back to this like symbolic uh you know semiotic chain it's only a signifier in its own neologism that whereas like for instance yeah uh poor jelly let's let's look at leclerc's uh patient poor jelly that's a neologism we could say we could argue but it has meaning only in so far as that it is like a punctual moment for the unconscious and the mm -hmm. royal road to the unconscious especially as it manifests as a condensation in a dream but this galopinaire or nerve contact is something for the psychotic patients that has nothing to do with metaphorization um uh you know like in the clinic it's something that operates for them outside of the clinic and they know about it and that's the main thing because something like uh poor jelly is something that was ultimately reconstructed reconstru poor jelly is reconstructed it's reconstructed artificially in a sense exactly it's retroactively not like it was wait it's not like that condensation was waiting to be discovered it exactly constructed but it, it, you bring up a really interesting point is that it's like here the psychotic brings to the analyst a specific choice signifier yeah the world together it doesn't need to be reconstructed it's there it's there and, and it's very much a uh linchpin of their yeah. reality in a way that gives us us i say as if i'm an analyst but gives a view into the way the unconscious works the way it reasons and what's interesting about that is it's like the this kind of dialectical inertia however speaks to the let's say irrationality or meaninglessness of meaning as such where it's like grappling with we talked about this during the last session but grappling with a, the propriety of one's reactions and responses to the system of rules and prohibitions mm -hmm. that carve up and structure one's life world it has to necessarily depend on a kind of repression for this movement of signification to take place whereas and for that to happen again the signifying dimension 
as such, it it, it does need to be isolated. Yeah. And yeah. we need yeah. to understand conventional responses to something. We need to understand how to follow rules. We don't necessarily need to understand the totalized meaning behind any of this. But for the psychotic, the question of these signifiers as the motor of meaning as such is all important. Yeah. And they can't get their minds wrapped around the, the this kind of displacement to get from one signifier to another. Yeah. And because so like, let's look at like psychopathology of everyday life. Like, you know, it's a perfect example of how Freud is with an intellectual colleague and they look at Signorelli's painting, Orvieto of Life and Death. It's like the last judgment in which like, I think like Satan is is coming and like you see like a bunch of like people and it's the theme of like life and death and he forgets the name when he's trying to explain the painting and so he being freud does a free association unto himself and he thinks of botticelli botticelli and you just get these network of different signifiers in which different names come up and then like not even just things that rhyme with botticelli botticelli but even they have an internal rhyme scheme ultimately to come up to Signorelli, but it wasn't the fact that Signorelli was repression, but that Signorelli is a signifier that relates to uh, another signifier, the subject for another signifier, which is his patient uh, who was like a Turk, I think, Turkish, and they were known to be very sexually active, and he was like, oh, uh, I'm impotent, and for me, a life without sex is not a life worth living. He committed suicide, so it's like the sort of guilt uh, held on the, on the hands of Floyd because he felt like it was like his fault that the patient committed suicide and he couldn't do anything to treat him. And also the fact that sexuality was a big part of the discovery in psychoanalysis and that it was very hard to talk about uh, in fear of being persecuted, you know, and not being scientific because everybody was approved at the time. And so that's like the sort of condensation, maybe you could say, uh, and, and why that name Signorelli was forgotten. And like I may be going on a tangent, but like the point is, is like you have to go through all these different like, you know, jumps and hoops through different signifiers, you know, before you reconstruct something, as you're saying. But it's like there's no unconscious. The you know part of of repression is not that it's like you personally put things down. It's like no, like as we talk about um, in seminar one, uh, Lacan equates repression to like forgetting, but it's also like you forget that you have the mechanism of forgetting. That's the main thing, and so something like galopinere or nerve contacts are not repressed. These are things that are like almost, you could say high functioning for the psychotic because it's all there. Right. It's all there. And it's all there insofar as we have two different antipodes of meaning of pure meaning that despite being like on separate ends of this spectrum have a lot to do with each other and he says that we have the word which is the solution to like the resolution to something basically the the key word which will solve an enigma that is a full meaning and then we have the word like the wolf for the wolf child which right. is the refrain that is repeated again and again in this sort of nonsensical yeah. fashion but he says both the fullest and the emptiest signifiers bring meaning to a halt yeah and we get the structure of delusion right there yeah. And it's interesting because then he uh, gives us another dichotomy later, skipping ahead here. But I'm wondering if there's some connection between these two dichotomies. There is the fides and the faint. So the fides is, I should say, both of these concepts um, illustrate this principle or one of his apothegms of the 
uh, message being returned to the sender in inverted. Yeah. And we have Fides as he's a speech that gives itself like a vow, a yeah. pact. Yeah. Speech that changes a situation. You are my woman. Yeah. Saying, I do. When you yeah. get married, you are my master. Yeah. What happens here is still within speech. And I think I always get hung up on this word inverted, but I think I finally understand it. It's like inverted in the sense that you are, the word itself turns your situation inside out and exposes yeah. you to the other who must ratify the decision. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, you put yourself in a totally vulnerable position there. Yeah. Now, at the opposite end of this spectrum, we have the faint F E I N T, like in fencing or yeah. sword fighting, you know, have a, yeah, a, a, you fake someone out, sort of. Yeah, so you deceive like, them, yeah. That, and this is the famous Freud joke. Zizek talks about it a lot. Why did you tell me you're going to Krakow if you're really going to Krakow? Yeah. The old Jewish joke where you have these two figures who are so used to deceiving each other and lying <laughs> to each other that the true deception what really sets off alarm bells for the one guy is the fact that he is actually going where he says he's going yeah the krakow so it's like another level of deception via the truth right here we get again an otherness that bubbles to the surface let's say that emerges, which is right. the condition of language working, let's say. These are the two dimensions, which are actually in some ways one and the same. If you think about taking a vow, that's the opposite of deception. Yeah. I think it's like the truest, the, the most effectivity. Right. Language can attain whereas yeah. then you have the faint where it's like you have pure deception language and it's deceiving ability either way there's an a big other yeah which is somehow involved in the level of but well, just truthfulness but the, I, I like it that. and maybe maybe i may be going off on a limb but i want to play with that like with the whole thing of a vow it's like because Right. It's like, um, you know, when they say like, when they say their vows, like, I like, you know, I do or whatever. And like the the priest or, or whatever is like, uh, if any of you object on their marriage, like, go ahead and speak now. And, you know, it's usually silent. But then it's like, if anybody believes that, like, you know, these two shouldn't be married, go ahead and uh, say now. But like, people don't say anything, but they laugh. You know, that's like a common theme now. But it's like, I wonder if like in there we get this sort of like faint or deception in which like they don't say no, but they laugh about it. But yet it's still like kind of like cynically carried on that they still get married. And it's like, not that these two personally should not get married, but it's like the sort of way and they feel about like the, the vows of marriage of like the sort of, I mean, you get what I'm saying? Like that can only happen in the sort of like uh, neurotic structure, right? Right, exactly. Where if you watch a lot of comedies, you know, comedy series, pay attention to the jokes. Um, you know, obviously humor has many different sources, many different kinds of humor, but so much humor ultimately um takes its effect from the fact that language is being played with that you know not just puns but also the kind of the emptiness of formal language itself right the, the source of a lot of comedy and just putting that on display drawing attention to the emptiness or someone taking a certain statement that's made too seriously to bring it back to psychosis however they don't have an absolute other to depend on for 
either the fides or the faint yeah. to mean what they mean in that it's like that sort of empty conventionality they are, let's say they aren't afforded the emptiness yeah of, of speech that makes it speech i want to i want to bring up this point in i think it's the page before he talks about fetus and faint um or two pages before no it's the page before but he mentions something about Schraver and he's like saying with the delusions that and i think this is perfectly appropriate with the psychotic speech it's like you think you're dealing with someone who is communicating with you because he speaks the same language as you and then when he is saying uh what he is saying is so understandable that you get the feeling particularly if you are a psychoanalyst that here is someone who has penetrated in a more profound way than is given to the common a lot of mortals into the very mechanism of the system of the unconscious. But right here, he marks specifically something that Schraber says uh, in the second chapter of his work. Schraber expresses in passing, enlightenment rarely given to mortals has been given to me. And I thought that was like really interesting in which like he said that right there. It's like, he's so certain about in these delusion delusions i always want to say delus maybe there's a condensation with with delusion and delus you know <laughs> that's my own sure. sort of witticism <laughs> but like right here like one of the main things about like delusions is that they for the psychotic, like they are certain about them, that they have a, a sort of knowledge that they could sequester from mortals or from everybody else that isn't them. The, these imaginary others that somehow, you know, are their enemy or going to hack their brain or are watching them or, you know, are the government, you know, spying on them or something like that. The, the, the divine that hits their nerve contacts, etc. Which is interesting because it's like they are addressed in this manner by the delusions and hallucinations to which they're subject, but they don't demand recognition in the way a neurotic does, right? No. Which is like here on page 40, he talks about master-slave dialectic and how it depends on there being a big other yes for the yeah. slave to be recognized by the master the slave or or the slave the slave recognizes the master as his master and in turn in a strange way he says keeps his humanity intact whereas the master is one who only enjoys absolutely um, so what does that have to do with well the psychotic it's that behind both the master and slave though there is this big other which ensures that their relationship yeah. holds but this is a relationship of recognition right and it's so like for the psychotic the psychotic isn't demanding recognition in this sense and it's like when you look at, for instance, a king or a pope, the scepter is the sort of phallic function that is more than the king or more than the, the a pope or, or the cross that a pope bears, not a scepter, but the cross is more than the pope, but it is a phallic function because it extends outside of them and has symbolic efficiency that's more than just the imaginary person. And so those that are under them, whether it's the like other theologians or the, the common people, or like a king and the sort of serfs, you know, there is that mediation based upon the symbolic big other that has something. And sometimes the imaginary and framing, when we look at it in a clinical aspect or just like on the level of obsession or neurosis, they create this imaginary scenario of a master-slave dialectic of, uh, you know, rivalry for mutual recognition. It's that they posit this other imaginary other in the placeholder as big other right and if they beat them it's like it's almost like in a sense it's like 
they risk symbolic death because not only do they take the imaginary other out of that position, but they also risk uh, destroying even their own symbolic order itself. Something you said about the Pope and the um, scepter. Or the, the king and the scepter, the, the Pope and the... Um, the Pope and the scroll or what's that and, called? And the, the cross. Well, oh no, they do have a scepter, right? No, I was just thinking of the king and the crown. But yeah, all these phallic, phallic objects that are outside and, and, and are more than the person. Yeah, and when it comes to this theme of recognition, it is thanks to the impression given by those phallic objects that recognition by the other is secured. Whereas for the psychotic, I feel like we could juxtapose the address to recognition. And I don't think it's coincidental that Schraber isn't able to live up to the role put on him yeah. of being recognized as president here. And in lieu of recognition, what we get are these voices that address yeah. Schraber. But it's definitely not the same thing as the kind of recognition that requires a mutual reciprocal dynamic of assumption of roles of let's say like seeing things from the perspective of your alter ego and that's why I think Lacan here on page 41 and 42 unpacks these different ways of negating that Freud outlines of I love him you love me it's not I who love him it's she right. it's not him that I love it's her I do not love him I hate him he hates me it's like there's this di this is dialectic and yeah. this is the opposite of dialectic inertia and in that we assume different roles and that there is this kind of it is very imaginary in terms of the identifications but these are symbolically mediated yeah this is this is where he's talking about like the sort of dialectic and like the uh, jealousy with like imaginary and symbolic like that can only happen on the fact that we have symbolic structures uh jealous of the other person of what the other person has right because that is also something that could manifest in i mean both uh, hysteric and, and and the obsessional but like in so far as that the other has something that um you know I can enjoy that I lack or that me as the hysteric have something that the other is lacking and I lure them into this fantasy and produce jealousy because I'm with somebody else that I could give it to. But literally I need their um, their own uh, longing, their own desire to sustain my desire. So there is a lot of that in play because of the functioning of the symbolic order and the way that Again, we shouldn't see these registers as separate, although they, they could be definitely cut off. And this is what we see in psychosis because it's foreclosed. But there is a linkage between these three registers. They not. This is, this is the whole point of later Lacan. But for now, you know, without getting into that, we could see how there is this interlocked relationship of the symbolic and the imaginary, especially for the everyday person or just the the neurotic hysteric uh, individual and this dialectic of jealousy is is definitely a key aspect because when i was talking about the master slave dialectic what the slave wants is the other's enjoyment but if they get the other's enjoyment the other ceases to exist and i cease to exist because i can only exist with the mutual recognition and the recognition of the other but once I get that enjoyment, they cease to be the other and I cease to live symbolically and in their imaginary gaze. Yeah, I, I have to take back what I said about like this, these three three kinds of negation not applying to psychosis and paranoia, though, because it seems like here he's saying that these are examples of paranoid jealousy. It's but paranoid jealousy. It's, it's paranoid called jealousy um, that in, he says inflates. 
the other two universal proportions essentially yes so yeah this this uh, sort of paranoid jealousy is called erotomania and it was seen as a sort of psychotic thing but really you can see this happening on a neurotic level and i would even say that maybe there is a sort of psychotic structure to it but it's like this example of jealousy is like a sort of reconciling with foreclosure it's like they don't want foreclosure to happen but it's like it's almost happening and this second line of defense is uh, erotomania almost in the sense of like this essay that Darian Lear has where he talks about a bipolar sort of being a last resort defense line against the contradictions of the unconscious being foreclosed and uh, enabling psychosis so it's like these imaginary symptoms of bipolar and erotomania are doing that because it's trying to hold on to something of the symbolic but it, it just can't and and uh i don't know if i said this in the last recording or if this was offline but it's like the way we could think about the way the name of the father operates and i learned this from uh, our fellow friend samuel mccormick from uh lectures on the con check out his channel uh for the typical neurotic the name of the father is admitted like this by a no with a period at the end in the psychotic it is no with a exclamation point if no already means something as a negation or a not then why affirm it and positivize it more with an exclamation rather than just a pure declaration this is what becomes crucial in the psychotic because it is administered in a sort of double down traumatic way all the time always all the time whereas the no for a neurotic can be such that and they could have imaginary traumatic experiences but yet the law still enables them to be symbolic subjects and neurotic subjects even if they had an abusive father but before it was the typical no don't do this just over time they had an abusive family etc the neurosis is still there but for a psychotic it's always been a traumatic encounter with the threat of castration that was always resisted the no isn't assumed as the mainspring of one subjectivity by an i personal pronoun yeah the no is a traumatic impossible to integrate yeah utterance yeah definitely and then like i mean this is where we even get into like the uh sort of deadlock of the prohibition of enjoyment if it's also an impossible thing uh especially with zizek but it's like if it's impossible why double down on it right in the sort of traumatic and authoritarian way right Should we quilt it there? Yeah. All right. We will be back next week with the famous, I've just been to the butchers. I know you're a fan of this chapter. Yeah. yeah. So in the meantime, visit your local butcher. Yep. Up steak. Pick up uh, maybe some, uh, the, the gabagoo. If you, if you pick up, pick up some gabagoo. gabagoo. And, and quilt quilt your psychosis yeah if you can yeah all right y'all enjoy your all nerves contacts uh. <laughs>